The abduction phenomena, contact phenomena, people who are either taken or perceivably taken by these beings, or even it could, I believe it could be that their their consciousness is projecting these experiences. Not to say that they're not real, but they're taking place in a different density or a different spectrum or an astral realm which could be just as real as this reality but I, I believe that a lot of the extraterrestrial and paranormal experiences where people have contact with entities may be taking place in a different spectrum of reality yeah. correct and this one experience showed me how important it is to be aware of what timeline you're on of what you're believing in, and to always keep an open mind don't let your mind fall out of your head but you always get all the information you can before t committing to any belief and still you may not even want to then but this experience it, it turned into a puzzle box i had these portals and they were going to show me what a false reality can be like yeah every every week i <laughs> i have a show that that really blows my mind i can't say that there's one topic in particular but it's the way that everything connects to each other the, the, the true nature of our reality and how the extraterrestrial ufo phenomena connects with our consciousness that also connects with ghosts and the paranormal it also connects with magic and mysticism and i think just the fact that everything does lead to each another in some aspect is probably the most fascinating thing that I I've experienced throughout all of it so welcome everyone today we have an interview with Chris Matthew from Forbidden Knowledge News and Forbidden Knowledge News is a podcast that you should check out for sure or you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and all the other apps and Chris is very passionate about paranormal subjects and anything from UFOs to psychedelics, spirituality, meditation etc. So Chris interviews guests that talk about some of these subjects and some of these people are some of the biggest names in the world and he has hundreds if not thousands maybe even over 1000 I'm not sure but definitely hundreds of these interviews in long format on his podcast and I appeared twice on his podcast so you might want to check that out as well but I decided to talk to Chris today and he shares his story with us so Chris for example same like me had been impacted by using magic mushrooms same like me he had some big big revelations and we are gonna talk about it in this episode of True Fear podcast and this is a definitely interesting conversation another thing is that Chris launched his first documentary a couple of months ago which covers some of the occult history of Louisiana because Louisiana is actually one of the most paranormal states in the US and Chris grew up there so so he made a documentary talking to experts covering supposed Bigfoot uh, sightings or things like I don't know werewolf sightings and Wudu and so many other things so we are kind of jumping between the topics but definitely spirituality metaphysics paranormal psychedelics a little bit of everything so before we're gonna get into the interview I need to say one thing because in the second part of the interview we touched very briefly on some of the topics that Big Tech doesn't like and I'm not gonna say it here I decided to split this interview into two parts so if you are watching the video version of this podcast on YouTube you will be able to watch only part one on YouTube and part two is on Rumble and Rumble is like this kind of uh, alternative 
to YouTube. So you're going to see the links in the description if you want to watch part two. And if you are listening to this podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or some other apps, you will be able to listen to the full version in audio. So that's what I wanted to say about it here. And one more thing before we're going to get into the conversation. So if you are someone who is watching or listening to my content regularly and you enjoy it, please consider becoming a YouTube supporter. You can become a YouTube supporter for as little as three bucks and it's not much for you, I hope, but for us it can make a big difference. And depending on the support level on YouTube, when you become a subscriber, you can get access to some exclusive perks. You can get access to hidden Telegram group, for example, where you can suggest topics, ask questions, um, suggest guests, you know, all sorts of things like that. And this helps to fund the podcast and uh, gives you good karma back. Also, January, February, it's a good time to start moving forward and get into a good shape mentally, physically, spiritually, right? It's a good time to make changes. So maybe you want to check out my online course called Exit the Matrix. All you have to do is go to truefury.com forward slash academy and you get a full comprehensive course with 30 modules that help you to figure out what is blocking you from reaching your goals and help you to transform your life in all sorts of ways in relationships, career, figure out your purpose and it has guided meditations and other things so it's an amazing course at very 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 little price, very little cost because you can get it for only 60 bucks at the moment still. All you have to do is use the coupon code Black Friday together at the checkout. I'm still offering this deal throughout January for sure and February hopefully. So go to truefeel.com forward slash academy and remember to use the coupon code Black Friday at the checkout together. And enough of me talking. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Chris Matthew. Okay, this is Mike Sigula from truefury.com and this is Truefury Podcast and my guest today is Chris Matthew. Chris is a host and founder of Forbidden Knowledge News Podcast a documentary filmmaker and a researcher of the paranormal and occult. He has interviewed hundreds of world-renowned researchers and authorities in the fields of esoteric science, philosophy, mysticism, spirituality, and so on. Chris is also the director and producer of the forbidden documentary Occult Louisiana, which covers the mysteries and the occult history of Louisiana. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike, thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing your stories because uh, I appeared on your show twice already. Thank you for that. And I'm normally, uh, you know, you, you can produce so much content. I'm always blown away <laughs> with uh, your pace because uh, whenever I check some of your interviews there's just so much stuff there so i don't know how you're doing it but uh, yeah i do it just to because i have nothing better to do honestly (laughs) no it, it keeps it keeps the revenue flowing it keeps my blood flowing it keeps my creativity flowing and it's something that I've been passionate about, so it's uh, it's pretty easy to put it out there because I really enjoy doing it. So that's where that's where I'm at with that the amount of content. <laughs> yeah, no, I like the range of subjects you normally focus on, and uh, you also I know you had a lot of experiences with psychedelics, which is something my domain as well. So I hope I'm gonna hear some stories from you, but. 
Maybe we can start, uh, if you could just give us a summary of, let's say, your awakening journey and, uh, you know, like how you started and uh, all the story till now. Sure, sure. And again, thank you so much for having me. It's always nice to be on the other side of the microphone in this conversation sometimes. So thank you again. Uh, yeah, my journey started in about 2012 and that's really just when i started to become aware of the hidden reality that we are surrounded with government corruption i wasn't really into the spiritual aspects at that time but it was opening up i had i was in a corporate type of job and i was making pretty good money but i was miserable doing this and I, at the same time, I had started doing research into all the topics that I now cover from the occult and extraterrestrials to government conspiracies and health and all these types of topics that eventually became dangerous to talk about. But back in 2012 and 2013, I was just kind of becoming aware of a lot of these things and just diving into as many rabbit holes as possible. So I just decided to start a Facebook blog because I had to do something with this information. I'd try to tell my friends and family and they thought I was crazy. So it's like, I don't know, someone, someone has to be into this stuff. So I started a, a Facebook blog and it, it picked up pretty, pretty quickly. A lot of people started reading my articles and, and things like that, but I, I quickly decided that I needed to to feature people who knew more about some of this information than I did. So I started reaching out to some of my favorite authors and researchers and people that I've been looking into on different radio shows and the podcasting had just kind of started to pick up then. They had a few podcasts that I was listening to as well, but mainly just from the all of the wonderful hidden topics from hidden history and the occult and everything like that, these uh, amazing researchers that I had been looking into at the time, and I reached out to them, and I started a YouTube channel where I would started interviewing these people. I also did different reports about things happening, strange things happening around the planets and UFOs. It was a little different when it first started, but it was mainly focused on Facebook and then YouTube. We did the YouTube thing where I would interview some people. And eventually I came across my friend Charlie Robinson, who, thank God, suggested I start a podcast. And uh, I did so. He hooked me up with my now producer and um, we started that up. And that very quickly started to pick up steam too. And in the beginning, we started the podcast around, oh man, about 2015 or 16. So it was mainly a YouTube channel for a couple of years. 2016, we start the podcast and that starts to pick up a little steam. Uh, in no way we're making enough revenue to have it be a career type thing at that time. Uh, I was still working my, my corporate job, doing corporate sales and I was miserable doing that, and I really wanted to transition over to this full-time podcasting thing. And I didn't see at the time how I would be able to do it. I um, I was also, during the same time period after starting the podcast, going through a bad breakup, kind of like a stalking situation. I had to get a restraining order against this chick. It was pretty crazy. Uh, but it at that time it really triggered a seeking in my spiritual side and i i wanted to to find out more about mysticism and metaphysics and how it all connects to me personally and if it even does and really i started exploring that side and i i, I was kind of lost in a way and i i started to meditate and was horrible at it at first couldn't really slow Can my I, mind down i really just, couldn't yeah sorry i want to say some, one thing so it's interesting yeah. how you said you were kind of leaving the toxic past behind you yeah in terms of your job and in terms of your uh personal life and kind of moving into the new path in life simultaneously these two areas were kind of happening in the same period right 
because yes. uh, career, you know, you moved into something you love doing. Mm -hmm. And with your um, personal life, you left this toxic relationship and then this kind of triggered the spiritual path as well, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So th then I started meditating and it, like I said, in the beginning, not much success, couldn't really slow the mind down, but I felt as this, this was something I had to do because there, there's a lot that I needed to work through and probably heal. And at the time I didn't even realize that I just had the intuitive feeling to start meditating. And like I said, same time, stuck in this job trying to do the podcasting thing after work and on weekends and really wanted to, that to pick up going through a bad relationship so i was trying to find answers and one evening i did and i was um i was out it it, it, uh, it happened very strangely i was just outside talking with a neighbor and i saw what looked like three bright orange flames in the sky and the try and like a triangular formation just going up very slowly and i was looking at it i was trying to get my neighbor's attention to look at it and he was oblivious he didn't even want to just kept talking and talking but i was looking at this thing and all of a sudden it looked like it just shot up and blinked out of existence and i honestly don't know if this has any connection to anything i just it's just part of what happened mm -hmm. the same evening and maybe it had a connection maybe it didn't but i just filed it in the interesting category in my brain and went on with the evening and decided to try meditating again and i was after listening to techniques from friends and colleagues and people that i interviewed i was trying some things and put on 432 hertz tones and did a few things and was able to get into a deep meditative state eventually and was also able to make contact with what i now understand as my higher self and various spirit guides and probably ancestors that eventually came along and introduced themselves. But it started with my higher self that was communicating with me. And I thought either I had gone crazy or it was some sort of maybe acid flashback. I didn't know what was happening at first because I knew that this, I, I'd never communicated with myself in this way. I never talked to my, it was a, it could tell it was an external voice and I felt this incredible feeling of love surrounding it. And, you know, it, it, the voice proceeded to say, it's time for us to have a conversation. You've been seeking some answers. If you want to get to a place where you are content and happy in your life, you're going to have to heal some childhood traumas, some uh, relationship issues, all kinds of things that it's, you know, we're going to, it also said that we're going to be heading into a very difficult time in the near future. And this was right at 2020 when this happened. But then, and, uh, sorry. go ahead. Um, so was it like downloads telepathic, let's say, what do you just know or yes. more like you hear a voice in your mind? It was, <laughs> it wasn't a voice. It was, it Just was something like, like instant right. instant communication, instant downloads. It was emotions and images that just kind of automatically translated into this form of language where I understood what it was telling me. And it kind of translated into this kind of voice, but it was an inner voice. It was like your own kind of voice, how it talks to you sometimes. And you know how you have these weird thoughts that come out of nowhere and you're like, was that me thinking that? So it kind of like that, but it also was associated with a very powerful emotional feeling of love and just this knowing, like you said, I would just know and understand what this, this voice, this conscious entity was, was telling me. And it continued for about an hour. I was even able to, pop out of the meditative state and walk around my house and still communicate with this inner voice for a while. Eventually it faded away, but it gave me, it downloaded me with all sorts of information, things that I can do to start healing myself. One of those was plant medicines. It came along in the conversation, magic oh. mushrooms. <laughs> and it was very interesting. I was like, really, is this, you know, I haven't thought about psychedelics since I was teenager, early twenties. Is this just my inner child trying to rock out and party again? I don't know what was going on, but that that's one of the things that came up as well as, you know, just 
things that I started needed to start looking into in order to further my career in this whole podcasting thing, because the voice said, that's what I need to be doing. I need to quit my job as soon as possible because it's horrible for my mental and emotional state, which it really was. I dreaded going to that job every day. Uh, so eventually I'd, I had a couple of other meditative sessions with where this voice showed up. There was a very profound one where I had images of being on a craft that's the only thing i can describe mm -hmm. it as and these multiple etheric entities showed up beaming love at me and <laughs> they were all like cloaked entities and they looked to me like these animal hybrids i understand mm -hmm. now that they were all um, kind of like what i understand as cosmic ancestors they were all connected to me in some way telling me kind of reinforcing what my higher self had said the previous and giving me more information on how to proceed with the next steps of what I should be doing. And one of those was first quit my job at, you know, I had very, you had a little bit of money saved and I didn't want to do that because that was terrifying to me. Uh, start exploring plant medicines, consciousness exploration, and start researching certain topics metaphysical uh energy manipulation things like that and um all kinds of wonderful information on how to proceed but i was terrified to do so eventually my job got so awful and i got so mad one day <laughs> i just said fuck it and excuse i don't know if i can say that sorry but uh i pulled out it's okay my, uh, you can say it <laughs> okay so i said fuck it i pulled out my 401k at the time my producer Corey had moved in with me temporarily and I was like, look, I'm quitting my job. Let's, let's make this podcasting thing work at the time. We're only making a couple hundred dollars a month off the whole podcasting thing. And I took out my whole 401 K and I was like, I got to get, I was in a small town in South Louisiana, which I had lived there most of my life. I said, I had got to get out of there. Got to quit my job. And we just took off to Colorado. I'd always wanted to go to Colorado I always went to see the mountains and we started out in Denver and within a few months, it was a terrifying few months, probably almost closer to a year it took. We started actually making money on the podcast and eventually we would be able to pay rent and eventually we'd be able to pay rent and eat. And it, it snowballed into something very amazing that we weren't expecting and I get the sense it's just because I took that leap of faith to do so. And it was something that I, I was, you know, supposed to be doing in a sense. So that's where I'm at now. And the podcast eventually took off. And within a couple of years, I got the download after doing plant medicines. And there's plenty of stories there. But I got a download to do a film, a documentary. Mm -hmm. And I, within a few months i took a trip back to louisiana and decided to make my first film about louisiana and all its high strangeness because it, it's the most one of the most paranormal locations in the united states it has such a rich history and i went and filmed interviewed people uh got a bunch of footage went visit us uh, some amazing locations got all the content i would need and then started producing it. At first, it was going to be pro uh, we wanted it to be like a three part mini series, thirty minutes each. But that was a little difficult to produce, so we turned it into a ninety minute film. And uh, yeah, it's coming out on multiple streaming platforms in the next few weeks. So we will keep everybody updated. It's been picked up by Stash TV and a few other ones. We're expecting to be. Uh, so we're going to put out a list of all the places people can get it as soon as they appear on those platforms, and we're very excited about it, and we're actually starting production on the next film. So that is where we're at with Forbidden Knowledge News. Kind what of a long-winded answer. Um, yeah, thanks. What do you think why uh, Louisiana has a lot of paranormal activities? And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about some of these topics i started watching the documentary two days ago haven't finished yet yeah but uh you know uh let, tell us a little bit more about it um what do you think about why why this place is special 
Mm, I, th- I think there's several reasons why. First off is be- probably because of the dark history that surrounds a lot of what unfolded in Louisiana. You have everything from the slave trade, which was very big down there, the plantation homes, lots mm. of dark history surrounding that, lots of uh, unlawful deaths and horrors that you couldn't imagine that were done to the slaves. Um, so that puts out some dense, dark energy. And then we have this history that most people don't even know about, which I covered in the documentary. And that is the pre native Americans that could have been connected to extremely advanced civilizations like at Atlantis and these mound builders that would build these advanced structures and probably cities that don't look like anything like they would back then but i had dr gregory little talk talk about it and that history goes back much further than anything we could have ever imagined documented in fact older than the pyramids so i cover a lot of our interesting history and i think uh, in combination with the history and the the dark energy that beat from the dark things that unfolded i think that there's also this just underlying energetic properties that lie in the swamps in those areas Mm -hmm. you can feel it when you walk out there there's this dense energy and i know that there's not really a ley line going directly through some of those areas there's some near them but i don't think it's necessarily have to have a ley line going through to have some of these strange energetic properties it's probably like i said a combination of a lot of things and I think it affects people that live there. There's a lot of, a lot of suicides, a lot of drug abuse, mm-hmm. a lot of alcoholism, and people feel trapped at times in some of those areas. So it's a, it can be a very dark place. But I, you know, I enjoy growing up there. the The people there are amazing and incredible. It's a beautiful landscape, and it just has this strange dark energy surrounding it uh, in many places. I. Notice, I mean, when I was checking the movie, you guys talked about uh, Dogman, right? Which is a werewolf, right? Yes. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because yeah, um, apparently yeah, yeah. there are some witnesses there, right? Yes, we have, there's plenty of witnesses. And this Dogman, it's, it's, it ha- it's, as far as I know, a global phenomenon, but I focused on the ones in that have been witnessed in Louisiana, and I have a one particular witness. His name is Scott Pace, and he's not only seen the dog man, he's seen Bigfoot and many other types of entities. But, okay. I he said he saw Bigfoot and Dogman same evening or something like that. Yes, yes, he did. Uh, to me, that sounds almost uh, too good to be true. It does, doesn't <laughs> it? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And um, well, Scott, he's just I was skeptical at first when I heard about his story. I've had him on my show multiple times. I've went to his house. I've sat down with him. I've talked with his wife. I talked with his neighbors. This guy had no interest in any of this stuff before he had his experience. And he's just a humble hunter. He goes to church every Sunday. He's not looking for notoriety. He's interested in this stuff now because all kinds of crazy stuff happened after his first sighting, which was of a dog man and a Bigfoot at the same time. Um, so the dog man is basically, like you said, a werewolf type creature, very tall, uh, humanoid. It has a big snout and we, most of the audience probably knows who Bigfoot is. Well, Scott was out hunting deer and he was in his deer blind, which is like a little elevated tower thing that, he, that hunters will sit in and wait for deer to come by. And he said, he noticed first of all his rifle was vibrating and he'd never seen anything like that before and he kind of grabbed it to stop and he sensed that there was something out in about i don't know 20 30 feet away from him so he picked up his phone and he saw something moving in the brush and he tried to see what it was on his phone and took a picture and he enlarged it and he he said wow that looks like a big guy a big man (laughs) So then he says he picks up his rifle because he wanted to see what it was. He wasn't trying to, you know, shoot at this thing. He was looking through the scope to get a better view. 
And he saw, he said he saw it was, it had to be about a seven to eight foot tall humanoid covered in hair with black skin. Uh, it, it had matted type of hair with dreadlocks like you would kind of see if you would be in the swamps for a very long time in the dirty swamps of South, South Louisiana. This is how these creatures hair would probably mat. And he said it was a Bigfoot. And shortly after he he senses there's something else. So he pans the rifle over, I think, to the right or left, one of the sides of this creature, and he sees what he only describes as a seven or eight foot tall humanoid with a dog's snout and hair all over the place. He said it was much lankier and skinnier than the Bigfoot. And then on top of everything, he starts to sense that these things are psychically communicating with him. Like I was, like I was telling you that I had this psychic communication with my higher self. This voice showed up in his mind and said, put the gun down or I'm going to come up over there and kill you. And he sensed it was coming from this dog creature. Then he hears this other voice say, no, he's not pointing the gun at you. He's just looking at you. Don't do that. Scott doesn't know what to do. He's never experienced anything like this before. He tries to think back to them or project thoughts to them that he's not going to hurt them. And he hears this just extremely loud commanding voice say, get out now. So he does. He packs up everything and starts running out of there. And he says when he looks back, he sees about three or four very tall humanoid creatures slowly following him out, I guess, to make sure he leaves the area. After that, he just starts having all kinds of insane experiences within the the coming months and years from Mm. witnessing more Bigfoot and Dogman to now he has missing time and he has memories of extraterrestrial beings so does this all connect i don't know seemingly so but it's very uh, very very interesting and uh dog man is is seen throughout the united states and it's uh it can be they from what i hear there's different types of manifestations of this some are more metaphysical it seems like it's a ghostly or almost etheric presence and some say that's a very physical thing and I have Tony Merkel in my documentary. He talks about how this guy's dog was ripped to shreds by one. So it's a very, mm. very interesting thing going on there. Yeah, I I'm, I noticed that in many myths, there is a lot of truth. Because um, let's say, I don't know, you have this myth of a ghost that can float and move through walls. And uh, I had an out-of-body experience and I was floating, right? I was kind of hoovering. So all these things always come from some kind of real stories very often. So I would not be, um, you know, I think this wouldn't be so surprising. And I heard uh, from uh, some other people who, for example, would uh, check with whatever it was, uh, Yeti, for example, apparently they're more like fourth density race. So they kind of same like you have elementals that they will exist beyond our frequency in fourth density. And uh, one time on mushrooms, I had uh, some gnomes or something, two of them, they were just staring at us uh, when we were having a session in the forest. So I've, I think this there is a lot of this stuff, you know, all these things exist probably, if not physically, um, most likely, you know, in a higher density, so something like that. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think that, especially in if you look at Scott's case, once you have this initial experience and your perception changes and your awareness changes and you accept the fact that these entities are real, it changes something in your consciousness and your psyche and you're seemingly able to perceive other things that are also around you. Like it, it's progressed from the Bigfoot to shadow people to other small creatures in the forest to, like I said, now he's having missing time. He has accounts where he'll wake up and have memories of seven to eight foot tall extraterrestrials escorting him down a ship hallway and things like that. So it's very interesting how these things can progress there. 
Yeah, this is interesting with missing time and uh, some kind of abduction uh, accounts because this repeats quite often with mm. people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly does. And I I mean with especially with what I've done on the show the abduction phenomena, contact phenomena, people who are either taken or perceivably taken by these beings or even it could, I believe it could be that their their consciousness is projecting these experiences, not to say that they're not real, but they're taking place in a different density or a different spectrum or an astral realm which could be just as real as this reality but i i believe that a lot of the extraterrestrial and paranormal experiences where people have contact with entities may be taking place in a different spectrum of reality yeah um so another thing i wanted to ask you because you had mostly experiences with mushrooms right when it gets to psychedelics mm -hmm. have you tried ayahuasca or any other no uh, I've, um, I've i've used lsd whenever i was younger um that was actually the first psychedelic i ever took and just did it as a teenager in early 20s as kind of like a party thing and it was very irreverently used and <laughs> didn't have much respect for psychedelics at the time and i hadn't really i tried mushrooms a couple of times as when i was younger and didn't really have the positive experiences that i had now i i I know it's probably because I wasn't ready to have those experiences. So I had forgotten for years about psychedelics and until I started having do, doing this show and having guests that talked a lot about the connections between our consciousness and how psychedelics can affect it and ayahuasca, magic mushrooms, how these can be doorways to our perception and communication tools with different entities and ancestors and even your higher self. So yeah. I, and I didn't really even become interested in that until I had my, my first meditative contact experience where that was brought up and I started kind of looking into it and synchronicity started to happen where guests started to come on about psychedelics and I became more interested. And then eventually when I moved to Colorado, I started growing my own mushrooms, which are now legal here. And oh. uh, that's that's a wonderful thing. But yeah, so I started growing my own and having my own consciousness explorations and very, very profound experiences there. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I might have lost track of your question. Uh, you no, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I had a very similar experiences. So when I was like 19, 20, I was experimenting with mushrooms and LSD on parties or with a bunch of mates doing stupid stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, first time I had a like this spiritual experience. So, so I had a break for like 12 years or something. And then at 33, I had this uh, big spiritual experience when I kind of became my higher self and I could see reality all of reality at the same time from from that level and other stuff but um you know i think it's sometimes it's like when you are too young and you are not developed fully yet um they not gonna work as they should for these types of bigger experiences perhaps you know when you're like 20 for many people are still not fully mature and things like that mm -hmm. but it's also once you kind of get on the path and uh, you know become interested in spiritual subjects or start doing something about it then you are way more likely to have these big experiences so what's like out of uh, all the experiences and sessions you've done what do you think was like the most interesting from some of these experiences oh man there, there's been quite a few i i think probably would be the experience i had with one of my one of my exes <laughs> now i had um, i had been doing these personal consciousness explorations by myself for for a good while for over a year 
uh, you know, probably once a month or every other month. And I'd have, I wasn't really taking heroic doses at the time, probably about two to three grams, which was enough for me at the time to have, you know, to get through some blocks and have some, get some information going and have some experiences that were somewhat pro profound until I had, uh, I was, it was with one of my exes and we're no longer together. And I think this had a lot to do. With <laughs> uh, she, so she had never supposedly never done mushrooms before and she wanted to have an experience. So, I was going to facilitate and, you know, kind of help her out with her first experience. So she started out with just a couple of grams like I, I did. I think I took two or three. And um, she, after like an hour, hour and a half, she said she still didn't feel anything. You know, she, she said she felt sleepy kind of. <laughs> and uh, I, this is very strange. So I was like, look, we'll give you some more. There's no way you can really overdose. We'll keep it up i think it we ended up giving her like five grams total <laughs> first time first time, first time experience. <laughs> she didn't she's uh, i don't and i was i was whacked out of my mind you know i was very much having an experience and i knew these mushrooms were very good so this was very strange and i you know i still have my suspicions and things that go through my mind as to why but i won't bring that up or anything here i will tell you what happened though so she doesn't feel anything. I'm having a very profound experience. And she also, I should, should note, is probably still a, a psychic healer. Hmm. And she suggested, well, hey, would you want to try and do some regression, maybe get to some childhood trauma? Uh, I Looking back may have been a mistake, but I said, yeah, let's let's do that. So... She proceeds to guide me to a, a childhood memory that was traumatic, and it it seemed to be working. You know, I we it's, it seemed to get to the root of everything, and it was a very profound and enlightening experience. And I felt amazing after. And within a few minutes, uh, note again, she still says not didn't feel anything the whole time. Oh, <laughs> uh, so and finally, I, finally, she got smashed. <laughs> No, 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 no. So I, no, the, I'm telling you the whole time she says she never felt anything. But I, I turn around and look at her and we're having this conversation seemingly, seemingly normal. And all of a sudden we're having this conversation and it becomes darker by the minute. And I don't, and I'm kind of failing to understand exactly what she's saying, but it sounded like she said, you know, I found you a long time ago when I came to this planet. I attached myself to you. I gave you love. I brought you where you are now. I And now you're, you're not going to love me anymore. And I'm look, I said, what? I looked at her <laughs> and she, I should you not, in my perception, she shapeshifted into this giant reptilian bee. <laughs> She was even a couple of feet taller <laughs> than my girlfriend was, and she had big teeth, big yellow eyes. Dude, I said, oh, shit, I ran out of there. I'm looking behind, and this thing is chasing me down my house saying, what, you don't love me anymore? <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. I run to my basement, and at this point, my whole house has changed into something it's like i'm in a different dimension there's bars on the windows i look outside the sky is blood red there seems to be like spider webs and mold everywhere and i keep a clean now this is not my house i'm like what is going on i was freaking out i managed to lose her in the house somewhere i don't know where she's at so i just run upstairs to my room i close the door I don't, i'm freaking out i don't know what to do it's like never had an experience like this this is uh, you know i've done psychedelics a lot they never an all-encompassing change of my reality like this and i don't know what to do so i jump in the shower and i just start running water and praying <laughs> i'm like <laughs> Like, God help me, what is going on? Please, God. And within a couple of minutes of praying, I feel this like rumble within myself. 
And this voice comes out of me, I imagine, and I didn't say it. I hear it, though. It says, no, you're being deceived. And after that, after that happens, I start puking up this black, st- I shit you not, this mm. black substance into the tub. And it went down the drain. I kind of wish I would have saved it looking back to examine what the hell I puked up because it was viscous and black and looked like tar. Mm. But after I did that, the, everything just popped back to normal. In fact, the lights were brighter than ever in the room. I felt like I was, I felt like this loving presence around me again. I felt like this powerful love and everything was back to normal. And I walk outside and my girlfriend's sitting on the bed and she's just kind of like, uh, I saw what happened. She's like, I think some sort of entity took over and was tr- took over your perception and was trying to do something to you. And so I just started praying and meditating and just looking back at the relationship I had with this person, it was a suspect to begin with. Things really fell apart after that. I started <laughs> to see this other side of her that was very negative, uh, very materialistic, very cold and I just got this gut feeling, no, I should not be, I should not be in this relationship. But, you <laughs> so, know. you know, it may have been a reflection of something about her or it could be something else. I don't know, man. But did you discuss, um, because that's what you heard when you said she started getting darker and darker with the, you know, what she was saying. Did you discuss it? Ask her if she said what you heard? Yes, I did. Yes. And, and she, she what said, did she say? She said no. She was said that she was saying something completely different, that something about where she was from as a kid. Mm. But I that it's very strange that I didn't hear any of that. And it, what I did hear is even weirder. So, you know, take it for, for what you, you know, with a grain of salt, it, it is an experience with a psychoactive substance, although it was like, a doorway to seeing what was in the future in a sense. Yeah. You know, it you was know, very interesting. I hear these stories that it's not a good idea to do psychedelics with your fiance or your partner. Uh, well, now let me tell you this. Uh, uh, I, before you go too far with that, I, my fi- my current girlfriend, well, my, she's of my fiance now, we grow mushrooms together and we have experiences all the time together and they're always beautiful. They're always wonderful experiences. They're always loving. I think it okay. just depends on if it's ooh, the right ooh. person or not. Okay. You know, <laughs> Cause uh, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I read biography or autobiography of Richard Branson, you know, mm. the billionaire guy. And he said something that he was doing LSD with his girlfriend when he was young and he ended up, I think, having sex with her on LSD. And he, like, she looked like a monster or whatever. And after after, <laughs> after that, uh, he just said, like, he lost interest in her. <laughs> so, well, you know, like, maybe it could be a mistake. reflection of something energetic about that person. You know, yeah, that's what I think maybe. it could be possibly that the mushroom was trying to show me something negative about this person that I shouldn't be involved with. And that's kind yeah. of the in- conclusion I came to. No, yeah, no. Like if you say now it's uh, completely different with your well, partner. The, the, the reason moment. I say that is looking back at all my experiences, the mushroom has never lied about anything. <laughs> I may have misinterpreted things. I may have let my ego get in the way of certain messages, but it has never led me in the wrong direction. It has never given me a false truth. It, I, it was my interpretation that may have been wrong about the experience, but that's one thing that I can always take away is the mushroom isn't going to lie to me. So there was some truth in that experience. I just have to manage to perceive it in the right way, if you know what I mean. What about um, encounters uh, with entities, beings, for example, some kind of, uh, I don't know, some other very interesting stories on psychedelics? Oh, yeah. Well, um, there have been... So after that experience, 
I've noticed that it it opened up a new level of communication with my guides, my spirit guides, my higher self. And I started to sort of remember my spiritual mission and my soul mission here and what I should really be connecting to in my work and Mm. where I should be going in the future with my work. So uh, that doorway of communication kind of got blown open after that experience, as well as meeting my now fiance, who oddly enough encouraged heroic doses because she had done (laughs) heroic doses. And Mm. after that, my experiences got way more profound and the, the level of information and contact I've never had a a bad experience with this. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the the closest thing to a bad experience is what I've just told you with th- that ex girlfriend. And even then, I feel like I needed to have that experience to learn because I learned something from every experience. But some of the most profound after I started doing the heroic doses, one of them was very interesting. It, uh, it my entire room. Heroic, like, you mean like five, seven grams, something like that? Yeah, uh, it's like six grams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my entire room turned into like this. I can only describe it as a puzzle box with different portals. Mm. And my my guides told me that if I wanted to have an experience in perception of correct timelines and perception if i'm if i'm living in a a truth or if i'm living in a false belief so so for example say i believe i come across something that a guest tells me like the secret space program Hmm. and i blindly go and believe that everything this guest tells me is true and i start writing books about it and i start doing Mm -hmm. conferences just because it's one guest information well if it turns out this one guest is full of shit my whole reality and paradigm would crumble because I focused on that one timeline of information. This experience showed me. And you're spreading false information. And, yes, uh, yes. Yes. To others and affecting other people. Correct. And this one experience showed me how important it is to be aware of what timeline you're on, of what you're believing in, and to always keep an open mind. Don't let your mind fall out of your head, but you always get all the information you can before t- committing to any belief. And still, you may not yeah. even want to then. But this experience, it, it turned into a puzzle box. I had these portals. And they were going to show me what a false reality can be like. Mm. <laughs> and it was it was very interesting. These experiences, like first they showed me this kind of secret space type of reality where I was – it kind of like a matrix type of reality where I was a pilot of some kind of ship and that I was uh, born to fight aliens and all these ridiculous things that happen in the secret space program. And it walked me through this whole like lifetime of that until the end when it all collapsed on itself. And I realized that it was all bullshit and it, Mm. it kind of like collapsed on me and I couldn't breathe and I realized, oh, that was a false reality. They had another one where... But, sorry. Um, yeah. So do you think this was shown to you to not believe in some false ideas without, you know, saying that this is particularly like the secret space program is a false idea? Or I'm not because saying you that particularly be... is a false idea. I'm, I think this was more about being aware that there are bullshit ideas mm. out there and being so careful. Just like an example. Just an example. Yes, I believe okay. it was an example. I wasn't. I don't believe it was really trying to tell me the secret space program is bullshit. Although I do believe that there are aspects that are bullshit. It's just mainly a, a cautionary thing to be careful in what you believe in. Be careful in mm. what you focus your time in. Because if you focus too much, put too much time and belief in something, it could get you started on a very dark path. Uh, the, the other example was that uh, I had been genetically altered to be some sort of AI in this future, and that 
all the humans were really these AI robots and some kind of ridiculous concept. But the point was, it was a false reality. I went through this whole lifetime of this belief system. Mm. And again, it just crumbled on top of me. And I went through like two or three of these portals that mm. were all like false realities before I ultimately found one that was just my reality and i felt it and i knew it and i had a sense that this is the, the real thing and i lived through it and it was just my life and nothing collapsed at the end and it was just i felt like it was my guide showing me how to be become aware of basically bullshit in this reality and be careful what we latch on to and believe in yeah that's interesting uh, because like they probably showed you first of all the more you're gonna focus and believe in something the more you're likely to create such timeline and version of reality yes and also then you affect others as well who start listening to you and believing that so they can contribute to building that timeline or you know version and this is important with the type of impact we have and information because you know you impact hundreds of thousands of people for example i i and and you know some of these people are gonna listen to exactly what we tell them or what we believe in yes. or whatever or some of our guests and uh that's why i'm i'm very cautious with like who i uh pick for example even as a guest you know or because mm -hmm. i i don't like to like i some of the things i used to believe in in the past, uh, I don't believe in now, and I see a lot of flaws in some of the biggest names out there, you know, so kind of really have a very specific uh, perspective on many things now. Yeah. 